Listen, this is Easter 2024, so the title of this message is, So Will I. Will you and I follow Christ? You know, we celebrate the resurrection, but what's the point of celebrating the resurrection if we don't understand what it means? Why did Jesus come, live on the earth, die? A horrific death, humiliating, die on a cross for us, and then raise from the dead, God raised him from the dead, so that we can just sit and do nothing or we can just be complacent. That's not why he did it. He did it so we could be a follower. And today we're gonna to talk about the resurrection, but we're also gonna talk about what it means, why he did it, what he expects from you and I. John 3, 16 and 17, the Bible says, for this is how God loved the world he gave, his one and only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And if you want to see what God can do, because that's been our theme for the whole Easter weekend, is do you want to see what God can do? I don't know about you, but I want to see what God can do. We baptized for the weekend so far, we baptized over 300 people. You see, God loves you so much that everything he's done from creation to the cross and the resurrection has been for you. We are his greatest creation, and he wants us to know him. Of all the things we can look at, the beautiful sunset, the mountains, the wonders of the world, God said you, you and I are his greatest creative works when he created people. And we need to understand that. And he doesn't want to punish us. You're gonna hear this throughout this message. God didn't come and send Jesus to punish us, but to save us. So many people think that God is just up there waiting for you to make a mistake so he can swat you down or uh, condemn you or judge you, and that's not true. God knew ahead of time, before you ever come to him, before you were ever born, he knew ahead of time all the things you would do, good and bad. He knew it all, and he still sent Jesus for us. And we celebrate the resurrection. We have the biggest cross in New Mexico right there, I think. But I want you to hear it again. For whoever you are, you came, people say things about God. God doesn't want to punish anybody. He wants to save everyone. And if we want to see what God can do, we must follow him. But how? How do we follow him? Jesus laid it out for us. He made it very simple, very clear. The only way to get to life is through the cross, and the cross leads to the resurrection. Matthew 16, verses 21 through 26. From then on, Jesus began to tell his disciples plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and that he would suffer many terrible things at the hands of the elders, the leading priests, and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but on the third day, he would be raised from the dead. But Peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things. Heaven forbid, Lord, he said, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and said, get away from me, Satan. You are a dangerous trap to me. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. And that is the fight that we have in our culture today. Are you going to see things through the eyes of the word of God? Or are you going to see the eyes or see life through the human point of view. That's the struggle. Because our human side will say things like, you know, church folks say things like, we just want to love people into the kingdom. Can I tell you there's no scripture that says that? There's not one biblical reference to that. And what that means is for most people when they say that, that means we're going to compromise the truth so that we can get them in on false pretenses. Because then they never know the truth. You don't come to God any old way. I mean, we can come to God any old way we are. In other words, we come to him just like we are, but we come to him his way, and that is when you humble your heart and mind, he said, I'll save your life from eternal death. We come to him his way, it's not your way. And people try to intermingle human points of view and God's word, and it never works that way. Jesus was very clear in what he said. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way. Take up your cross 
and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? In other words, Jesus said you gotta take up your cross and follow him. And, and man, if you keep your life from God, you'll lose it one day. If you give your life to God, you'll save it. And then so many people in our world today, just like it was back then, they give up everything for stuff. How many in here have some stuff? I always use stuff, material, blessings, whatever. And it's okay to be blessed. It's okay to have. But when stuff has you, then it's a problem. And people give up their whole eternity for stuff on this earth that will one day fade away. And whatever you do on this earth stays on this earth. Money is only for earth, not for heaven. God doesn't need money in heaven. And some people give up their whole eternal life. Because be, truth, truth be known, there's only two things that happen to us when we die. Either we go to heaven because we've walked with God, or we go to hell because we've rejected God. People have said over many years, I've been doing this a long time, well, my Aunt Sarah, I believe she went to heaven. I said, why do you believe that? And they'll say, because she was a good woman. I said, but was she a saved woman? Nah, she didn't have much to do with God or the church, but surely God wouldn't take a good woman like that and not let him go to heaven. No, and it, we talk like it's God's choosing, but it's your choice. Aunt Susie, as nice as she was, as good as she was, her goodness and all of her goodness could not match God's holiness. And so we might think people are good on earth, but God says there's none good, only one, that's our Heavenly Father, according to the scriptures. And we think just because we're good according to our standards that you're going to heaven. But none of us can be good enough for God's standards. That's why he sent Jesus. That's why we're celebrating his resurrection today. Because without Jesus, there's no hope for humanity. There's no hope for heaven. And so, you know, I've never been at one funeral even as bad as people are. I mean, I've sat in funerals when someone has said to me, who are they talking about? I knew this guy. He was nothing like that. He was an awful human being. I'm like, I don't know, it's them. They're talking the way they want. We always make everybody great when they die. Come on. I mean, I've never seen anybody give a eulogy like, that's the sorriest dude I've ever met in my life. He was awful, he was mean, he was this, he was a drunk. I've never heard that. It's always, oh, he was the nicest guy. And people looking around like, who are they talking about? But folks, all of your goodness doesn't match God's holiness. That's why Jesus came. And to say it does means we just negate the sacrifice of Jesus. You see, Peter, the scriptures preceding this, Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And they said, Elijah, the prophet, come back. And they named a few names. And then Jesus looked at him and said, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Messiah, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, Peter, flesh and blood hadn't revealed that to you but my Father in heaven. And upon this rock, I'll build my church. Not on the rock of Peter, but on the rock of this truth that Jesus is the Christ and the Messiah and the only Savior and hope for the world. That's why he, he did that. And so Jesus uses this, this thought about cross. He talks about how he's gonna be crucified. And then he goes on to tell the disciples, this is how you become a disciple. You pick up your cross daily and follow me. Jesus gave a word, word picture that they, they would likely understand in those ancient days. We may not get it real well, but what it meant over 2,000 years ago when the Romans would crucify people, they, they think it's the most brutal way to be killed. There's no more brutal way than to be crucified. But what would happen is the Romans would make the criminals that were convicted of a crime to be crucified, they would make them carry their cross to where they were gonna be crucified on it at. So they would have to carry their own cross. And so Jesus was giving this metaphor to them that's saying, he was telling them, I'm gonna be crucified, but man, for you to be my follower, you gotta take up your cross and follow me. And what that meant is there's no turning back. There's no turning to the left or right because once you were convicted, there was no pardons. They weren't waiting to call the governors or the governor and say, hey, is there a stay on this execution? Once they decided you were gonna be crucified, once you picked up that cross, you were a dead man walking. 
And Jesus used this metaphor to say, if you're gonna be my disciple, if you're gonna truly celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, then there's only one way to do that, and that's his way. You gotta take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, along the way, as you're carrying a cross, as Jesus did, you might stumble, you might fall, you might, you might make mistakes, you, but you get back up, you pick up that cross daily, and you keep following him. That's what Jesus was telling all of humanity then and now. It's no different. We might use terms like, you gotta be all in. There's no options. You know, once you're in, you're in. You don't get out. Jesus used that because they would understand it. So that's, that's what it meant. Today, people do not carry wooden crosses to the death, but Jesus' meaning went beyond the, that tool of execution anyway. It was a metaphor of self-denial, surrender, and servanthood. Jesus calls us to crucify, to put to death our own plans and desires. We're to stop trying to gratify the flesh with our human point of view. Jesus said we must take up our cross. Our taking up is really a matter of bowing down. Jesus never hid the cost of discipleship. He calls us to bow in absolute surrender to him. This isn't a mystical, deeper life activity for some spiritual super elites. It is for all who desire to follow the Lord. It's for anyone willing to count the cost. Surrendering is easy when life is running smoothly, though, isn't it? But surrendering to God's will can be more difficult during struggles and trials. And Jesus said we will face many troubles. We will likely suffer in some way as we follow in his steps. Folks, Jesus never said if you come to me that all your problems will be taken care of. He said you, you, will, you, will, um, you will have trouble, you will have tribulations, you will have trials, but lo, I'm with you always. Jesus never leaves us nor forsakes us. In other words, he's with you through all those. He never said you wouldn't have them. And what happens to people? They said, yeah, I'm gonna follow Christ until something bad happens or something goes wrong in their life. And then they, then they reject God and say, God, if you love me, this shouldn't happen. When did God ever say you weren't gonna have issues? When did God ever say when you come to him, it was gonna be a bed of roses and every time you walked out your door, you're gonna have this beautiful fragrance and music was gonna be playing in the background? You know, that elevator music. He never said that. He said exactly the opposite, but yet people, because we, it, sometimes it's tough. In fact, I'll say this, most of us, in, until we got saved, we didn't even realize we had problems. How many of y'all realized when you got saved you had some stuff? We all thought we were pretty good. Hey, I'm just living my life the way I know to live my life. I thought I was a pretty good guy, and then I got saved, and they said, you gotta stop this, and this, and this, and this, and this. I'm like, that's my whole stinking life. I gotta stop everything, I might as well die right now. And they said, exactly, you gotta die to Christ. You gotta die to your flesh. You gotta die to this stuff. And my flesh retorted and said, no! Then they took my music away. Made me listen to quartet music. If I can endure that, you can endure anything. They didn't have this popular music when I got saved. It went from Led Zeppelin, Lionel Richie, you know, ZZ Top to quartets, <laughs> Peaches and Herb, I mean, Ronnie Millsap, I mean, I was like, but they told me it was of the devil. I'm like, Ronnie seems like a pretty good guy. <laughs> Seriously, you had to give it all up. And I did, and now I think back, if I'd have just had those eight tracks, some of y'all don't even know what those are. If I'd have still had my eight tracks with all that, they might have been worth something. I don't know what, but maybe. But we burned them. You said you burned them? Yeah, they said we're having a bonfire. We're gonna burn all that ungodly music. So I'm like, but Lionel sang easy like Sunday morning. Come on. Led Zeppelin said, Stair sang Stairway to Heaven. I get ACDC. They said Highway to Hell. We don't wanna go there. I did live before I was a preacher, just so you know. But today, our discipleship, we don't want to crucify our flesh because when you do and you follow Christ, it means rejection and persecution. It means being willing to share in the sufferings of Christ. It's a choice to be made daily. It means that you're going to be unfriended. Is that the term for Facebook? You're just going to be unfriended. I, I've had people say, they, def they unfriended me. I'm like, so what? Oh, if it hurts, I don't know why. No, who cares? 
Just unfriend them back. <laughs> but Jesus said, we must follow him. The disciples were called individually, leaving family, friends, and occupations to follow Jesus. No doubt in the crowd as Jesus spoke that day, some had still not come to him for salvation. In calling people to salvation, Jesus called them to a life of loyal obedience and service. He made the terms clear. If we don't deny ourselves and carry our cross and follow Jesus, we cannot be his disciples. Jesus, Jesus you see, deeply loved them. And he knew they would soon become sorrowful and confused with the events leading up to his crucifixion. He wanted them to get a glimpse of kingdom living, which he had already taught them about in the Sermon on the Mount. He warned them about the legalistic teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. He warned them about the deceptive teachings that, that is so big in our world today, that people get deceived. They, they think, and I've heard them say, well, I believe God is this way, I believe God is that way. Then when you say, but the Bible doesn't say that, I've had people say, I don't care what the Bible says, it's what I believe. And folks, that is not the way you follow Christ. We must wanna know what the Bible says. And if what we believe is contrary to the scriptures, then we change our thinking and our life to adapt ourselves to the word of God and not to human reasoning. So it's the same today, you can't be deceived. And so many people think they're Jesus' disciples, but they're not picking up their cross and following him. One of the scariest scriptures to me in all of the Bible is in Matthew 7, verses about 21 through 24. And Jesus said, in the last days, in those days, men will come up. One translation says, men will strut up to Jesus and say, Jesus, Lord Jesus, we bashed the demons in your name. We built big buildings. We did all these great things in your name. And Jesus said, you know what I'm gonna say to them? I'm gonna look right at them and say, I don't know you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness and iniquity. What was he saying? He's saying, listen, folks, none of us give our resume to Jesus and they were giving him his resume they were telling him all the great things they did in his name and Jesus said isn't that wonderful but you never followed me you did what make you you did what made you feel important but you didn't follow me in the simple things and he rejected them but they knew him as Lord but they didn't follow him as Lord and how many people in America know Jesus as Lord but they don't follow him as Lord some of you are Christmas and Easter only folk. And so I always say this, I take my best shot at you. My hope and prayer is that you change your life and you begin to follow Jesus. Because just like God, we don't, want you to, we don't want you to miss out. And so Nancy DeMoss Wogmuth described what true discipleship does not look like. Jesus called his followers to take up their cross and follow him, to suffer for his sake, she said. By ignoring the calling, that calling, I'm afraid we produced a generation of soft, flabby disciples who don't have much of a stomach for the battles of the Christian life. And when they encounter trials and temptations, they whimper and whine and make a dash for the quickest escape route. Billy Graham pulled no punches in describing what taking up our cross really looks like. Jesus meant what he was going Jesus meant that he was going to die as a criminal and he wanted you to go with him. Graham said, that means that you go back to your school, you go back to your work, you go back to your home, you go back into your communities and you live for Christ even though they crucify you even though they attack you and persecute you. We don't get put on a cross for that today. We get, we get people talking bad about us. And you know what? I, it's just gonna happen. If you do anything for Christ, someone's not gonna like you. I have Christians tell me all the time, well, I've never had anybody persecute me, and I'm like, huh. And then they tell me this, you know, your church gets in the news all the time. Our church doesn't ever get anything. And I said, I know. <laughs> because when you stand for nothing, what's the point? But when you stand for something, you're gonna be persecuted. As a person, as a person and a church. Folks, if, once you stand, when, I got, when I got born again and went home and told my family, they persecuted me. My mom thought I was in a cult. She told my older brother to take me out, start drinking again, because something's wrong with Steve. He just changed too much. And you got, I got persecuted. Not that they were mean or didn't love me, they just, 
They just thought I was nuts. How many of y'all went home and told your folks, I'm born again, I'm a child of God, and they thought you were crazy? Come on. Yeah, see, it happens. But we have to know who we follow. We have to know who changed our life. We have to know who brings joy and peace where there's no other way. God does. And so all of that is true, but here's what I want you to hear. In following Christ, it's not a joyless life, it's a joyful life. Jesus said in the Bible, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus focused on the joy that was to come after the cross. As his followers, we focus on how we will conform to his image as we become obedient disciples. We die daily because we believe there is joy on the other side of that cross, life on the other side of the tomb. Trevor Wax wrote, to die daily is just another way of saying, Lord, help me see the opportunities in life to follow you. Help me see those. That's what it's all about. And to tell you anything else would be wrong, would be a lie. There's only one way to follow Jesus, and that's his way. And yes, it's tough sometimes. Yes, we got this flesh we fight. Yes, we, you know, our flesh and our natural stuff wants to go do this, and but we say, oh, the Bible says don't do that. But, you know, sometimes we do it anyway. So just pick that cross right back up and keep walking. Jesus did not come to punish us, but to save each and every one of us. And though it may bring some pain and loss, the reward of self-denial, sacrifice, and servanthood is totally worth it. Jesus says, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. It's no deal to get everything we want but lose ourselves. We find our true identity and purpose as we surrender all to Christ. And you may be doing exactly what God wants you to do. But we find purpose. The world is confused. They have no purpose. They have no identity. So they keep making them up. But man, when you're born again and walk with Jesus, the resurrected Christ that we celebrate today, you have an identity. And you're to identify with Christ. And as you follow him, he'll lead and direct your path. And you will be exactly what he wants you to be in this life. So will you choose today to follow him? If creation was made to worship him, will you? If the stars are made to worship him, will you? If the mountains bow, will you? If the oceans roar his greatness, will you? If the rocks cry out, will you? The answer is, so will I. Choose to follow him today and find a new life. Folks, here's what's gonna happen. We have a special we're gonna do, then I'm gonna come back up and give you an opportunity to follow Christ and to be water baptized. Hope you enjoy this. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. In Him was life and that life was the light of all mankind. Through him, all things are made. By the sound of his voice, the universe came into being. Stars ignited. Planets formed, and the galaxies spun in harmonious orbits. God breathed, and life emerged. Diverse and wondrous. But his most profound creation was humanity. Unique. 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 Unique in bearing the image of the Creator. If 
God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Yet this great creation disobeyed God by eating the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was the one thing that God instructed them not to do. Introducing sin into the world. This sin severed the intimate connection between humanity and God. Casting a shadow of suffering and death all over the world. As time moved on, humanity continued to drift. The connection with their Creator, once so clear, became clouded by their own ambitions and desires. Yet, God's love remained steadfast. In a small corner of the vast universe, a child was born, a Savior who would bridge the gap between mankind and the divine. Jesus, who was God incarnate, was rejected by those he came to save. He willingly gave his life as they crucified him, bearing the weight of humanity's flaws and failures. His death seemed like a tragic end, but it was just the beginning. God of your promise, you don't speak in vain, no syllable empty or void. For once you have spoken On nature and science Follow the sound of your voice And as you speak A hundred billion creatures catch your breath Responding in pursuit Three days later, Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin and death. His resurrection offered a new narrative, forgiveness and redemption for all who believe. Those that call on the name of the Lord will be saved. So we call on his name, we worship him, we tell the world about him. As we gaze at the expanse of the night sky, we see not just a collection of distant stars, but a canvas of divine artistry. Each star, each planet, a brushstroke of a grander design inviting us to partake in the Creator's profound narrative. The same hands that shaped the galaxies shaped us, each created on purpose for a purpose. As we walk this earth, we carry this light. We are called to shine brightly, to love boldly, and to live in a way that echoes the Creator's original intent for humanity. Our lives are the ongoing whispers of a story that began before the foundations of the earth. We are part of something greater. Something beautiful, something eternal. We are not just observers. We are active participants. If the stars were made to worship, so will I. If the mountains bow in reverence, so
kill you created the light of the world abandoned in darkness to die and as you speak a hundred billion failures disappear where you lost your life so I You left the grave behind you, so will I. may be seated. The Bible says in Galatians 2.20, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, folks, the truth is this. Without Jesus, you're lost. Without Jesus, there's no relationship with God. There's no way to get to God that everyone goes through Jesus. Jesus is the Savior of the world. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Him or by Him. That's it. And so if you're here today and you say, Preacher, I've walked with God, but I've walked away. I'm ready to pick up that cross and begin to follow Him. I want to learn what it really means. And maybe it wasn't because you, you just dislike God. You just got busy with life, maybe something happened, and maybe you just weren't taught what it really means to follow Christ. But as we celebrate His resurrection today, let's do it by making a decision for Him. If you've walked with Him and walked away, today's your day to come home. Or maybe you're here and you've never given Jesus permission to your life. You've never said yes to Him. You know, so many people pray a prayer, and we've taught this in America. I don't know if they've taught it in other countries, but here I know that all you got to do is say this prayer, and you're saved forever. But my Bible teaches me that if I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth the Lordship of Jesus, then I'll be saved. We put salvation in front of Lordship, and the Word of God puts Lordship in front of salvation. I believe salvation is a byproduct of Lordship, that we make Him Lord of our life. That means He's the leader, we're the followers. That means we we go to Him and look to see what He says about subjects and topics and those things, and then I adjust my thinking to follow Him. It may go against the way I was raised or how my family taught or how church when I was younger taught, but what does the Bible say? That's what we have to find out. And my Bible teaches me that if we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths the Lordship of Jesus, He'll save your life from what? From all your sins, from eternal hell, from eternal death. He'll give you new life. That when you give your life to Jesus, and this is what He means, He said you'll save it. But if you keep it and hold it back, He said, you'll lose it. And what does it gain a man to gain the whole world or a woman and lose their soul? Folks, it won't be worth it at the end. So today, let's truly celebrate his resurrection by some of you who I know the Holy Spirit's dealing with. I don't have a sad story to tell you. I just give you an opportunity because it's the Holy Spirit who guides us and leads us. No man can save you. Only God can save you. And it's a gift. Salvation's a gift. You can't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift you must receive. So if you're willing to receive that gift right now with every head bowed, Father, in Jesus' name, 
as you're touching hearts and minds, may they respond to you in a way that's pleasing to you. In Jesus' name. If you're here with every head bowed and you say, Preacher, would you pray with me? I walked with God, but I walked away. I want to come home. Or Preacher, I'm ready to give Jesus permission in my life. I want to follow him. I don't understand it all, and neither do I, folks, to tell you the truth. I understand enough, though, that it's through Jesus that we have a relationship with the Heavenly Father, and only through him. There's only one true God, only one. And he's the creator of heaven and earth, and he created you and I. That's it. And the only way to get to have a relationship with him is through Jesus. And so if you're here and you say, you know, preacher, I want Jesus in my life. I do. Right where you're seated with every head bowed, just, just for next, another few moments, if that's you and you say, preacher, include me in your prayer, I'm ready. In Jesus' name, right where you're seated, are you ready? With no hesitation, would you just lift your hand all over this place and say you're talking to me? God bless you, 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 God bless you. Thank you. God bless you, 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 God bless you. God bless you. I just saw that hand. God bless you right here. God bless you. God bless you over there. As I look at God bless you, as I look across the top, God bless you, God bless you. God bless you. I'm looking across the top. You just put your hand up, put it down. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see that hand. See that hand right there. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. How do you know God's in the house? Thank you so much. God bless you right up here. How do you, God bless you. How do you know God? God bless you. How do you know God's in the house? God bless you. God bless you. Thank you so much. And you know God's in the house because you can't come unless the Holy Spirit draws you. We just think it's, I'm just, I'm just doing it on my own, but the Spirit of God draws you and then we agree with Him. It's called conviction. And the word conviction is better taught by meaning God is always trying to convince us that His ways are the right ways. So is there anybody else? You say, why do you want me to lift my hand? Because you're acknowledging Jesus before men. You're confessing Him right now. There's a form of that. And He said, if you do, God bless you. I'll confess you before my heavenly Father in heaven. I don't know about you. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I want my name said in heaven. I wanted, when I got saved, I wanted Jesus. Thank you. God bless you. I wanted Jesus to say, look, I told you, and here's their name, and we have a relationship with God from then on. God bless you. Thank you for waving at me. God bless you. God bless you. I see those hands. Just hands going up everywhere. God is, doesn't want to punish you. He wants to save you. God bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you, young man. Father, and you thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. God loves people. That's all I know. And he does love you, but you got to know the truth because it's the truth and only the truth that sets us free. Father, in Jesus' name, as people, thank you. Thank you, sir. As people have lifted their hands and acknowledged you before this whole family here, this group of people, I know you're saying their name in heaven and all heaven's rejoicing right now. Thank you. God bless you over here. Thank you. See, hands still going up. God, God cares. But you'll thank you. You never know how much he'll care until you say yes to him. Father, just hands keep going up. Bless each one, Lord, in Jesus' name. Listen, if you lifted your hand, I want you to pray this prayer aloud with me. The Bible says we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths. I want you to pray this prayer loud enough for your ears to hear your voice. And then if you're right with God and serving those that lifted their hands because there's so many, would you join us and pray with them? And maybe you didn't lift your hand, but you know you should have. I'm going to introduce you to Jesus because he's the Savior of the world. This church can't save you. Only God. Thank you. God bless you over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Saw those hands. Are you ready? Would you pray with me, church? Thank you. Would you pray, God? Thank you. I choose to believe in your son, Jesus. And I believe he was raised from the dead to give me a new life. And I believe he's the only way. And he's Lord of all. So today, I believe that in my heart. And now I willingly confess with my mouth, Jesus, be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. I choose you, God. Thank you for choosing me. Help me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord, church, if we would.